I guess I'll introduce myself and not to brag, but um, since 2002, I've been um, in Golf Digest Top Teachers in Missouri wow. every year. Um, I've won the Teacher of the Year twice in the Gateway PGA. Um, I've played a lot of competitive golf, probably over a thousand tournaments, though I haven't played in the last 20 years hardly at all. I'm 65 now, so I didn't play as a senior much, but, uh, and I've won nine times on different mini tours around the country, so I've, I've played a lot of golf. Uh, I've given over 40,000 private lessons since I've been teaching, and that doesn't count clinics like this, so that's just individuals. So I've, I've, I've done a lot and studied a lot and um, learned from some of the best players and some of the best instructors in the world. Um, and I don't specialize in any one area or any type of player. I enjoy working with beginners as much as I do tournament players. Um, and so um, in a lot of respects, beginners are more fun than anybody. You get, get them to hit it once up in the air and they're thrilled. And, when you work with a tournament player and it fades five yards, they're pissed off, you know? And so, so a lot of times it's a lot easier uh, working with beginners and a lot more fun, but I, but I enjoy working with both. Um, um, I've got nine girls Monday playing in the state tournament that I work with, which is pretty cool. So, so I work with lots of high school kids and I've had over a thousand high school kids that I've given lessons to that have played golf in college. So that's one of the things I'm really proud of. But I've been doing this for a long time. So um, I usually have eight or 10 kids each year go to play college somewhere. And that's not necessarily a testament about me. It's a lot of times it's just good players. And I'm lucky you get a reputation after a while working with good players and they seek you out. So uh, I tell them, I give them my advice, but they're the ones hitting the shots. So. And you guys are too, so that's what I would tell you. Um, whenever you're talking about short game, um, I include putting and pitching and chipping and bunker play in that discussion, okay? And uh, what I found is, as an instructor, I'll, I'll say that I'll say it this way. So somebody gets recommended to come see me I've never met them before they come out here for the first time and I say hey you know tell me a little bit about your golf game okay well you know um, I shoot somewhere between 85 and 90 most guys will tell me your guys' ages and they'll say I shoot you know I've been playing for 15 or 20 years and you know, I haven't really gotten any better but I've never had a lesson and and uh, you know, I like I said, I can shoot 85 and I can shoot 100 if it goes bad. And my name's Don. Yep. <laughs> and so, and I say, oh, I said, <laughs> and I say, well, what's? Tell me a little bit about your game and what's what's the best part of your game and all that. And they'll say, well, really, what I need to work on the most it's off the tee. I just can't get off the tee. I hit it out of bounds two or three times every time I play, or I lose a ball. And I'll say, oh, that's fine. What about your irons? And I'll say, well, you know, my short irons, pitch and wedge, nine iron, eight iron, I'm not too bad with. As the clubs get longer, I'm not very good. And I'll say, well, how about chipping and putting? And the guy that shoots 85 to 100 undoubtedly always tells me that that's the best part of their game, okay? And it never is, is my point. So instructors, we laugh about that because almost everybody that comes to us tells us that, oh, chipping and putting, that's pretty easy, I'm pretty good at it. And actually, they're lousy. Mm -hmm. And it's probably where they can pick up 10 strokes faster than anything is actually by becoming really good at chipping and putting. I don't discount that they need help with their driver, by the way, either. That, that's one of the hardest clubs to learn to hit. But, but it, it's undoubtedly that people tell me that you know, chipping and putting, they're pretty good at. Does that make sense? Well, how many putts do you have? Well, I never counted them. I said, well, count them next time you come and tell me how many putts you had last time. And they'll come and they had 42 putts, you know. They three putted eight times and four putted once, okay? That's because we lose less balls chipping and putting. I agree. I do agree with that. Less balls. Uh, right. And so, so this part of the game, if you really want to get better and you really want to shoot better scores, 
you really should spend time at this part of the game as much as anything. Uh, tour players, for instance, would practice two-thirds of their hours less than 50 yards to the hole. Two-thirds of their practice time, and they're practicing 25, 30 hours a week probably. So 20 hour, if they're 20 hours a week here, 10 hours a week hitting balls on the driving range, the best players in the world. The best players in the world get the ball up and down 65% of the time when they miss a green. The average scratch golfer, zero handicapper, only gets it up and down 30% of the time when he misses a green. The average 15 handicapper only gets it up and down 8% of the time that they play. Okay? So keep that in mind. You guys are all technology guys, I hear. This is a numbers game. You have to know your numbers. You have to know the statistics. And you have to learn to play by yardages. So that's going to be my first point that I'm going to make. How far do you hit pitch and wedge? 125. Okay. How far do you hit nine iron? 130. Okay. My point is everybody knows pretty close their yardages on full swings. But do you know how far to take a backswing to hit at 10 yards? Do you know how far to take a backswing to hit at 30 yards? Do you know how far to swing back to hit at 50 yards? Do you know what club to use? Does a 60 degree go a certain distance with a certain backswing and a 56 go a different distance? If you don't know the answers to those questions, those are where you need to learn and when to focus. The best players play by yardage on every single shot they hit. Okay? So they know that their landing spot on the green, they need to fly at 10 yards. They know how to hit at 10 yards. They know how to hit at low 10 yards. They know how to hit at high 10 yards. Okay? So I've got hula hoops from this bucket. I'm 10 yards to that hula hoop. I'm 15 yards to that one. About five feet short of this first flag is 30. So when, as a player, come down to a short game area. I used to go to a football field and do it when I was a kid, okay? And I'd walk out and put a towel at 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards, and I would learn to hit those different distances, okay? So most of the players I see, even really good players, tell me I'm a field player. I don't really get yardages. I just look at how far it is to go, and I play from there. Well. I think it's important to be a field player, but I think it's also important to have a yardage in mind each time you do. The reason is, is because all the greens are elevated. And so if I, if I have a shot, if you can imagine if I was over by that golf cart more and I have that bunker in between me and that flag that you can see over there. Now on the golf course, the flags are taller, but when I get down there and the green is elevated, and all I see is the flag stick over the top of the hill, I have really, unless I walk up there, I have no idea how much room there is from the edge of the green to the flag. Does that make sense? And it could be 40 feet, it could be five feet. So as a player, I have to walk up there and see how much room I have and where I want to land it to where I know if it lands here, it rolls to the hole. Does that make sense? And then when I come down there and I say that's 30 yards, well, that bunker is not even in play because I know I know it's 30 yards roughly to that first flag there. Um, and I know how hard to swing to hit a shot 30 yards because I practice it. Does that make sense? Yep. And so if I have the confidence that I can hit this shot the right distance, I'm not scared of that bunker. But the field player is scared to death of that bunker that has no concept of yardage. He's going to make sure it's not doesn't go in the bunker. So he's going to swing too hard. And if he hits it correctly, he's going to be past the hole pretty far. And his subconscious knows he's swinging too hard. 
So it's probably going to decel, and he's going to chunk it in the bunker anyway, and then he's going to take three more to get in the hole from there, and he's just made triple instead of a par. Does that make sense? Yeah. Understand? Yeah. And so if you don't learn anything from me, is to learn to practice the yardages. The best players practice at five yard increments. Okay? I don't recommend that for any of you. Frankly, I only recommend two yardages. 15 and 30. What you'll find is that's almost where you are. When you hit a bad shot and it hooks too much, you're almost always 30 yards left. When you hit a pretty good shot, but it hits the edge of the green and trickles down the slope, it ends up at 15. It's pretty amazing how many times you'll find that out. <coughs> so if there was only two things to do, in my opinion, it's to learn to hit at 15 yards and to learn to hit at 30, okay? Now, if you learn to do that with a 60 degree wedge, you'll have two different swings, club head speeds and lengths of swings. And then if you change clubs, you can find out how much farther does my gap wedge go with the same shot. And you might end up with a 50 yard shot. Does that make sense? Mm. Okay. So we can make the same swing and change clubs, or we can learn to do it all with one club. The tour players pretty much use one club 90% of the time. And so when the guys on TV say, boy, I'm surprised he's using his 60 degree wedge here. You know, I, Nick Faldo would say, I would use an eight iron and bump it in there. Well, they don't have time to practice eight iron bump shots, but they have time to practice every day with their 60 and they're better with their 60. And so that's why they're using it. They learn, you know, they'd rather be the master of one club, you know, than just mediocre with a bunch of other ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, the best players nowadays do not change clubs very often, but their club head speeds are so high. I mean, they're hitting drivers 300 yards in the air that they're pretty much using a 62 degree wedge probably because anything else goes too far. Does that make sense? So they need that loft. So that's one of the things that's changed. Any questions on that so far? Do you think that's good stuff to listen to, I hope? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I always read and hear that like, Amateurs probably shouldn't be using like 58, 60 degree wedges because they're just too hard to hit for most people. Well, I, I get that question a lot, and I'm, I'm told that a lot, that with players that I work with that I don't use my 60 because I'm lousy with it, okay? Um, I will say my answer to that would be this. The more loft I have, the more aggressive I can be with my swing, okay? Therefore, under pressure, that tends to hold up better than having to slow down and be gentle with a less lofted club. The other thing I would say is that when we get the ball off the fairway and we're in rough, the more aggressive I can be, the better as well to get the club through the grass. So in my opinion, most of our courses in Missouri have elevated greens like this, and you need loft to be able to get the ball up in the air. So I think it's worth learning to use a 58 and 60. Now, that's one of the subjects I wanted to talk about. So... <coughs> When I was young, um, my pitching wedge was 52 degrees. That was a standard pitching wedge loft. Most of them are 44 or 46 degrees today. The clubs, they keep de-lofting the standards on all the clubs. It wasn't very long after I was playing, still young, that the standard went to 50 degrees. Um, but because the pitching wedges are so strong lofted, we need gap wedges and most people probably need four wedges in their bag today. You need a pitching wedge, a gap wedge, a sand wedge, and a, some type of lofted wedge. 
depending on your club head speed depends on how big the gap should be between the clubs. Anybody that's 100 miles an hour or more should only have four degrees probably between clubs. So you would have a 60 degree wedge, a 56 degree wedge, a 52 degree wedge, your gap wedge, your pitching wedge, your gap wedge, I mean, would be 48, and then your pitching wedge would be 44, which is pretty well standard these days. That makes sense? So four degrees, but that's at 100 miles an hour. If you're less than 100 miles an hour, you probably should have six degrees aloft between clubs, and therefore you might only need three wedges. Does that make sense? You could have a 44 degree pitching wedge, maybe go to six degrees on a gap wedge to 48, go six degrees to 56, then maybe go four or six degrees either to 60 or 62, okay? So it depends on, with less club head speed, you don't have as big a gap between clubs, so you need it to spread out more. Does that make sense? And with more club head speed, you got bigger gaps, so you would have less, less degree aloft between clubs. Make sense? If you don't have that, you, you, you really should. If you're playing a lot of golf, you should. Now, also to answer your question, the clubs are made, there's four different ways that a golf club, each club is different than the other, okay? Um, obviously the length changes between each club, okay? Drivers nowadays 45, 46 inches long, okay? The loft of the face is obviously different with each club, right? Um, the shaft angles also change. So drivers, the shaft angle is a lot flatter and sand wedge is a lot steeper plane of a shaft angle, okay? But there's also forward lean differences. So here's my 60 degree wedge. If I sole it flat, do you see how far the handle is in front of the club head? You see that? That's 60 degrees aloft. The reason why most people cannot hit a 58 or 60 degree club is with a full swing they set up like this and now they've got like 75 degrees aloft on this face and the club just slides under it, it pops up in the air, don't go nowhere, or they blade it or chunk it, okay? So mostly the reason why players don't think those clubs are difficult to hit is they don't understand that with a full swing and impact, I have to be like this. If I'm like this, that club's worthless. Now around the green, I might be like this to hit it really high and soft, does that make sense? But to really hit this club correctly on a 50, 60, 70 yard shot, I have to be like this at impact. And so for most players, that means setting up with the ball farther back and my hands farther forward at address. It's the easiest way to do it for a, for a recreational player. A tour player almost sets up with everything in the middle at address, but then they learn at impact to be on that angle. So, but that's pretty high skill level and a lot of practice. So for most people with their wedges, just play it farther back with those really lofted clubs. By the time I get to gap wedge, I still have forward lean, but do you see it's not as much as what 60 was. By the time I get to seven iron, it'd be about like that. By the time I get to driver, the handle would actually be behind the face. That's why we play it forward. The club tells you where to set up if you understand how it's made. So, does that, and that, that's the model for the golf swing is the club. And not enough people understand that. You know, a lot of you, if you're golf fans, Bryson DeChambeau plays with same length iron, same lie angle on each thing, and all that changes is the loft. He's got 130 mile an hour club head speed with driver. So if he played with traditional clubs, his gaps between, he would have 30 yards between clubs. Too big a gap. So boy, single length, same lie angle, just changing the loft. Now he's got 12, 15 yards of gap between clubs. So that's why he can do it. Those single length clubs are nothing new. I remember back in the early 80s, Tommy Armour had single length clubs. 
commercial fought. Nobody could hit them. I, know, I mean, I tried it. I had, I had five-yard gaps between clubs. Everything went the same distance. Does that make sense? So the clubs are made the way they are on purpose, and if you understand how they're made, you can understand how to use them. And so that's one of the things I recommend a lot. Does that make sense? So learn to go 15 and 30, if nothing else. Uh, if you got a lot of time to practice, want to get good, you know, learn to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Does that make sense? Now, there's two things. Like I said, I've met some of the greatest instructors um, short game wise. In my opinion, there's four or five of them in the world that are the best. A guy named Dave Pels probably did as much research on short game stuff as anybody and, and was really one of the first ones to specialize in short shots. Um, there's a guy in Omaha named James Seekman, uh, who's a great instructor. I recommend looking him up on YouTube or whatever. He's got a couple books out. It's great. One of my good, dear friends that's from Missouri is a guy named Stan Utley. He teaches out in Scottsdale, Arizona. Played on tour for 20 years. Um, another great instructor. Um, yesterday I was at a seminar with a good friend of mine at Belle Reve named Jerry Tucker. He used to be the head pro there for years and Jerry's one of the great short game instructors in the world. And then the last guy is a guy named James uh, Ridyard and um, he's from England and uh, most of the European turf players go visit him at least once just to get his opinion on things and so those are some names if you're interested I recommend you can check them out they all got excellent books and a lot of the stuff I've learned over the years is from compilation really of all these guys okay so they have different theories on things and and I do too so Dave Pels was the first one that came up with if you if you can imagine I'm a clock this is six and this is twelve okay this is nine and this is three okay um, Dave Pels you know taught people to go to eight o'clock with a full swing and see how far it went go to nine o'clock ten o'clock eleven o'clock twelve o'clock okay um, in theory pretty good in my opinion Okay, at least the concept. In practice, though, I think the worst thing you can do as a player is think about where to stop on the way back. Our target's this way, and we're, if we're all we're thinking about is uh, this way. In my opinion, most people can't, ex they can execute it on the driving range, but they can't on the golf course. And so, however, if you would watch a tour player hit a 15-yard shot, their backswing would be about like that and their follow-through would be about like that, okay? And if you watched them hit a 30-yard shot, their backswing would be about like that and their follow-through would be bigger. And so are they stopping in different places? Yes, but they're letting the tempo and the speed of the backswing dictate when to stop does that make sense so i think as players if you're wanting to get better at these shots think of both you know understand the worst thing to do is to be real short and accelerate okay the second worst thing would be to be real long and then stop so somewhere in between is what we're trying to do and we really don't want to accelerate on short shots putts chips pitches we really, you know, want a very symmetrical, even motion back and through, no hit to it. We don't want to hit the ball. We want to let the ball get in the way. And then we want the ball to do what it wants to do. So if I'm a player that puts backspin on it and it checks all the time, great, I'm going to let the ball check. If I'm a player that it never checks, Big deal. We just learn where to land it. We'll just let it roll. Does that make sense? So let the ball do what it does with your swing. Don't try to force it to do something. Don't try to put backspin on it. Don't try not to put backspin on it. Do what you can do. 
most people will be somewhere in between there. A little bit of check, a little more roll, okay? Make sense so far? So, you know, so as a concept at 15 yards, you know, from here to there, it's probably all I need to swing. Does that make sense? But I'm gonna feel it with the tempo. And that's what I'm trying to find when I'm practicing, is that if I've got a 15 yard shot up the hill here and trying to land it um, at the hula hoop, um, you know, that's what I'm gonna tell myself. Boy, that one was 15 yards, does that make sense? If it goes 20, okay, that was 20. That's what it felt like to hit it 20. But you'll learn, you'll have a very good concept on distance if you'll think about it and practice it. Make sense so far? Okay, good. The other thing I would tell you is this. I don't differentiate a lot between chipping and pitching, but by definition, a chip shot would roll more than it carries and a pitch shot would roll less than it carries, okay? But I can hit a chip shot with a 60 degree and I can hit a pitch shot with a pitching wedge. So the, the club, it, it's irrelevant. Now, the difference between a chip and a pitch is a chip shot, the ball's going to be slightly back in my stance and my hands are going to be slightly more forward no matter what club I'm using, okay? And so, and I'm going to maintain that original angle, backswing and follow through, okay? So really it's just an arm swing and a body turn. Now, that, speaking of that, when I was taught 45 years ago, 50 years ago, um, we were taught it was an arm swing, chipping. Everything else stayed still, and all I did was move my arms. Well, we found that's a terribly wrong idea. Uh, for players that tend to flip their hands too much and either chunk it or skull it, chances are it's because nothing else is moving. If, if nothing moves, if my hips don't move and shoulders don't move, the only way I can move the club head is with my hands. And so you can try with all your might not to be risky, and you're going to be risky if you're not moving anything else. So the best players, the, my hips and my shoulders, when I hit these little pitch shots, I'm completely turned and facing my target when I'm finished. This club is still right here. It's never over here. It's always still right here in front of my chest and I'm gonna turn through all the time. If I just do it with my right hand only, you'll see that this will always move. My good friend Stan Utley teaches pitch shots that once this club is here, this handle goes up. And so, and when that handle goes up and my club strikes the turf, this knee straightens. So I'm here, that knee straightens, and that turns my left hip automatically once that so that's a great way to practice. When you're in the rough, unless you have a lot of green, you almost always have to pitch it. If you, if you, you have to be able to see more than half of the ball when you're in the rough to be able to chip it. If you can't see more than half of the ball above the grass, you have to create loft with a pitch shot with a wrist hinge. Okay, unless you just got 40 feet of green where you can chunk it on there and it'll roll like a bandit. But that's a problem. If, if you can't see the ball and you chip it, it's going to roll a lot. Does that make sense? Any questions on any of that so far? So it's one of the ways I like to practice. So practice the yardages. Whether you're chipping or pitching, we'll, when we hit some on our own here in a little bit, you can try this on your own. Um, I like to use an alignment stick and I like to put it behind the ball five or six inches. How many of you are chili dippers or bladers? Anybody in that? So whenever I, see I have to bottom out. Where, where do I want, if, if, if I'm hitting a chip shot, where do you think the club should bottom out? Has anybody got an answer for that? <laughs> couple inches behind the ball. Anybody else got an answer to that? No, I'd say, I'd say 
stay behind the ball to use the walk or the bounce on the club. Okay. Anybody else? This is a chip inch shot. Before the ball. Before you hit the ball? No, an inch before the ball. Meaning on the other yeah, side. About the, about the club face, yeah. get the ball up, so you hit through that, the ball. That, that's correct. When we're hitting a chip shot, when we're hitting a full swing iron shot, we want the bottom of our swing to be in front of the ball towards the target. Okay. Now when we hit a pitch shot, we want to bottom out directly under the ball, not behind it, under it. Now when we hit a bunker shot, we want to bottom out behind the ball. That's a different shot. But a pitch shot in the rough or off the turf here, I want to bottom out if the if the if my bottom's right there, that's where I'm going to bottom out every time so under the ball. Okay? When I'm chipping, if the ball if the ball is here on this line, um, I'm going to bottom out in front of this. I'm going to hit the ball first, but the true bottom of my swing is an inch or two or three in front of the ball. Okay? So, so when I practice chipping, if I have an alignment stick here and I flip my hands, I'm going to bottom out behind the ball. Does that make sense? And so this is great practice. You can set up here and um, hit these chip shots and brush the grass and not hit the stick. It's probably the best drill I can give anybody for chipping. So I play the ball back in my stance with my hands forward and it's just going to go up and down. And you can see I don't take hardly any divot on this zoysia and uh, I'm bottoming out just in front of the ball. Does that make sense? Great practice. I can do the same thing with a pitch shot here. Uh, I can have that there and I can. that's where I would put the ball where my divot is, does that make sense? But I shouldn't hit behind it. So if you're hitting behind it, where you're chunking them or blading them, do this drill. It'll, it'll, boy, in a bucket of balls, it'll greatly improve your chipping and pitching, okay? If I had one drill to tell you, that'd be, that'd be it, okay? How, how many skills do you think there are putting? What do we need to learn? Lots? How many? 99. 99? How many? How many do you think? Probably 10. Speed, uh, distance. Well, speed and distance is the same. Uh, so that's one. Uh, break. Okay, reading the greens. Reading the green. That's two. There's only one more. Oh, uh, No. We have to learn to hit it where we're aiming. Right? Yeah. That's all we got to do. We got to hit it straight. We have to hit it the right <laughs> speed. And we have to read the greens. In my opinion, over all the years of working with people putting, um, there's two areas that why most people miss putts. You might want to guess on what those are. For me, it's speed. Okay. Um, higher handicaps, I'd agree with that. But most people miss putts because they have poor aim and they're lousy green readers. And frankly, I would find the better the player is, if they miss putts, they're lousy green readers, okay? I promise you, even on tour today, Scotty Scheffler's been like, poor guy's been ripped the last six months how poor his putting is, but he doesn't putt bad, but him and his caddy just, in my opinion, are lousy green readers. He's either not trusting the read or they're not reading it right, because he's not hitting bad putts. I'd say Rory's in the same category, in my opinion. So most of those guys don't have bad strokes. Um, they don't have bad distance. If they're not making putts, they're not reading them right. So, so come out here. There's a, I have a ball marker here. And so if that's where my putt is to this hole, I want you to line that lineman stick on the line you would choose to make this. I want you to read it and how tell me how you read it. You just have 30 <laughs> seconds. 30 seconds. Good. And push it out there a little farther so this end is by the ball. Yep, like that. So you 
you can step back and look at it and you just tell me if that's your read when you're ready you just tell me I think that's good okay so what I have here this is how a lot of the tour players practice would you agree that um, if you stand behind me here Am I pretty well lined up where your stick is? All right, yeah, move it wherever you want. All right, go ahead and move that stick for me. It's windy as it is, it'll fall down if I let go here. You want me to hold it? Um, no, that's okay, I got it. All right, so if I, I've done this already, so I kind of know what the speed is, but if I start this on the ramp, the same place every time, it'll roll the same speed every time, and I can move it up and down the ramp to find the perfect speed. The perfect speed for this putt is if it doesn't go in, it should be a foot or so from the hole from this distance. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to roll it right here for now, and we'll see where it goes. And then you tell me if you have a chance to make this putt. Hand me a couple more balls. <laughs> no. So no. I'm going to go with no. So you don't. So there's. I'd say there, hit it harder. There's no way though. But if I hit it harder, I'm going to three putt. Would you agree with that? Definitely. Even that. But so does he? Did he read enough break? No. No. So what I found with some of the best tournament players that I've worked with, almost everybody underreads the break by at least fifty percent. So if you don't do anything from me today, whatever you read, double it. You'll probably be a better putter. Hand me a couple more balls, please, while I'm holding this up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this ramp more to the right until we find out where, does, where is the right break. Does that make sense? All right. Not enough, right? Maybe a little harder. I could go a little harder, and that might be pretty close. Oh, that could be it. All right. Now put that stick out in front of this one. You can see this is called the perfect putter because once I find the right line and right speed, it's going in every time. Do you see that? Good. So everybody walk up here and take a look at how much break that really is. It's pretty amazing. I picked this one on purpose because it's that. But do you see how many feet of break that is? I mean, that's up in here somewhere. Would you agree with that? And so the way a, a, a great putter practices, they use this to figure out the line. They use that. They take a gutter hanger as a wicket, and they put it right out here. They put their ball on that mark, and they practice hitting it through the wicket, hitting it at the right speed. And so their brain learns to see that correct amount of break. Does that make sense? Isn't that fascinating? And so most people would read it just like you read it, okay? Most people would read it exactly how you read it, and they would miss the putt, and they would blame their stroke, okay? Or their speed, whatever. But they would say, oh, I miss hit it. Must have pulled it. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend circling the... So you can see from the other side, from the downhill side? Um, yes, I do. Um, especially on downhill putts, like this one's downhill, I like to look uphill. If uphill putts, I don't think you need to go to the other side. But down, severe downhill, I like looking both. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Pretty interesting, I think. Called the perfect putter. It's a pretty neat little gadget. Uh, well, they're not legal to play with, but they're legal to practice with, yes. But uh, you'd be pretty good with it after a while. Yeah. Now, a couple things up here. I just want to mention. I don't use a lot of training aids full swing-wise. But putting I, there's a couple things I really like. One... This is called the putting arc, okay? You can go to theputtingarc.com and order you one. This one here is 35 years old. They don't make them out of wood anymore. They make them out of plastic, but I've had this one for a while. Um, the putting stroke is not, it can be, but 
the best putting strokes are actually in an arc. See the 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 shaft of the putter is not 90 degrees to the ground, okay? It, and it's not allowed to be by the rules in the rule book, okay? The old drunken Scottish guys, shepherds that invented this game, thought it'd be too easy if you could use a putter that had a 90 degree shaft angle like a croquet mallet. And so they said, we gotta have an angle, that makes it harder. So we got an angle, okay? Because it's an angle, there is an arc to the movement. So that angle is not this way, but you can see from here, that's a big arc back and through. Does that make sense? And you can see that if I'm here, the putter face points that way. And if I'm over here, the putter face points that way. Now I'm not manipulating that with my hands at all. It's just the arc does that, okay? Well, this putting arc, matches what the arc is for this shaft plane. Does that make sense? And so, if I can put that in the middle, and I can learn to feel what that correct arc feels like. Now on a three foot putt, that I'm just going back from here to here, you know, you can hardly tell if that's not straight back or straight through or an arc. Does that make sense? So it's almost straight back and straight through on short putts. <coughs> But if you learn to putt with an arc, you'll be better, okay? And so I'm a big fan of that, okay? The other thing that I would tell you about putting, it's changed a little over the years because our greens are so much better today than they were even 30 years ago, okay? And so as the greens get smoother and faster, um, if you watch old Shell's Wonderful World of Golf from the 60s, these guys had backswings like that and follow-throughs like that because they were literally putting on greens that were probably as long as this fringe. And so they had to generate speed to hit it hard enough to get it airborne. But now we don't. So it's very important that we learn to swing this putter in a pendulum motion back and through. No hit whatsoever, okay? I don't care if you're right hand low or left hand low or do a claw or have a long putter. We want to swing the head of the putter in a pendulum motion. A true pendulum motion, the back swing and forward swing is the same length. Does that make sense? Yes. Anybody remember, old enough to remember Ben Crenshaw? Does anybody know, was his putting stroke the same length back and through? Does anybody know? I don't know. No. It wasn't. He had a bigger backswing, shorter follow through. But he had a pendulum motion. When we make a pendulum motion and we make contact with something, shouldn't the putter slow down? Yes. So if you watch some of the great putters, Patrick Cantlay today, Lauren Roberts just a few years ago, they all have longer backswings and shorter follow-throughs because they're making a pure pendulum motion and when they make contact, the, the follow-through is not as long. So if you're one of those that were taught to accelerate through, Unless you're already a great putter in spite of doing that, I would not recommend it. You'll have much more trouble distance control wise that way. Learn to make a pendulum motion where there's no hit in it. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing that, remember I told you there's two skills, right? The best players um, in the world, if you did a poll and you said, how do you practice putting? Every one of them would tell you they do this probably eight hours a week or more. They find a pretty straight putt and they put a string on that line. Make sense? 
Somebody grab me a ball down there, please. The best players also, in my opinion, most of them learn to get their eyes over the target line when they're putting. Okay? Thank you. Come out here for me. <coughs> no, you. Come on here. So if I put the ball under the line, and you have a white line on your top of your putter, right? Yeah. So if you stand up here, and your eyes are over the target line, the string should be in the way of the white line on your putter. It's not. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll move, move until it does. All right. Yeah, so I'm looking Where were you? Was it over? I was over. Over is the worst place. Wow, there's, no, there's no worse place to be than over. There are some players that are inside, and I would allow somebody to get as much as two inches inside if that was their best lineup. But for most players, your vision is better if you're directly over the line. So go ahead and do that for me. Yeah, and so it should blot out the white line on your putter, the yellow string. And go ahead and hit it. Roll it right up that line. And so that's what they do is they practice on this straight line over and over and over. So they learn what a square putter looks like. They learn to get their eyes in the exact same place on every putt. And they learn to hit it on this line. Every putt is a straight putt. That putt down there was straight. I'm aiming four feet and letting the gravity curve it, but I'm not, I'm, it's still a straight putt to my target line. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. The other thing I will tell you about putting. And there's a lot of controversy these days. And in, in my opinion, the people that are opposed to what I'm about to say are nuts. Um, if you're not drawing a line on your ball or purchasing a ball like the TaylorMade ball or the Callaway ball or the PXG ball that's already got a line on there, you should. Almost all the players on the PGA Tour and maybe all the players on the LPGA Tour have a line on their ball. If you watch on TV, you will see they all have it lined up. Well, all the line on the ball becomes is a miniature string line that they practice on every day. Does that make sense? And so if the best players in the world, if almost all of them are using a line, it's because they know they putt better using a line. And, and that's why I say there's a lot of people that argue, oh, that makes you too line focused and not distance focused. <coughs> but it's, that's rubbish. If, if the best players are doing it, they, they're the ones that know. Everybody that's saying don't use a line is not one of the best players in the world. If you ask, you, the best players in the world have a line on their ball and they use it every time. That's all I'll say. If you're not doing it, you're crazy. Most people say, yeah, I tried to use the line, but it doesn't look like it's aimed where it's supposed to be. Well, that's, the, that's the, why you can't make a putt. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, use the line and trust it. If you get behind it, I mean, you can look behind this line and you can see it's lined up straight in the hole. If I stand over here and it looks like it's going that way, well, that's my vision issue. And that's normal, but we have to overcome it. I mean, I don't know if anybody hunts in here, but if you've got a really nice deer rifle with a scope on it, and you're really good at lining up the crosshairs and squeezing the trigger, well, if that scope isn't, if you haven't sighted it in, if that scope's three feet to the right of the target, you'll never hit your target if you're a good shot, would you? Nope. No, and so it's not any different putting. Does that make sense? Learn to aim, learn to read greens, and learn to hit at the right distance, and you'll be a good putter. And But man, use the line. Now I like to use a couple things. Say I'm going to this hole, 
and there's a big rock here but I'm going to use it anyway so I know I putt here every day so I know this breaks to the left a couple feet okay so if I line my ball up and um, if you look from behind you see it's pretty much right over that rock right there can everybody see that so I do two things and I recommend this highly I like to line my ball up where I think the line is and as I see that I think it's just above that rock but when I come over here not only can I aim my putter with the line on the ball but I can I picked out an intermediate target that's a foot or two in front of me so I do both and then once I'm here I can see that spot and then if I roll it over that mark I can tell I'm going to hit a pretty good putt from there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so use the line. Always get an intermediate. Learn to have a spot in front of your ball. Sometimes that's hard. There's nothing. If there's nothing, look at for one blade of grass. But you got to learn to spot putt. Any bowlers in here? Any good bowlers? If you bowl, do you look at the pins or do you look at the arrows? I look at the arrows. Right, it's easier to aim at something close to you than far away. Yeah, Line up your ball, pick an intermediate spot. Does that make sense? It's no different. All right, so far? Any questions on that? So, the other thing with putting, and I can't believe my car kids are so good that they picked up the green and there ain't a hundred balls out here. The way to practice, the way to practice your distance is the putt looking at the hole. So if you if you if you poll tour players on how do they practice, they practice on a straight line, and they practice putting looking at the hole a lot. And normally, oh thanks, just jump them right here. So what they would normally do is they would grab a, quite a few balls like this and they get a certain distance away. They'd get set up and they'd look at the hole and they would hit the putt. And they're trying to roll it down there the right speed. That's a little hard but it's not bad. And I'm just learning to con let my eyes tell me how hard do I swing this putter. Now if you watch on television they'll mark their ball. They got a line on it. This one breaks a little bit to the right. I'll aim it a little bit left. I got a spot picked out here too. I'll take my practice strokes looking at the hole and I'm pretending to hit it. And then I set up, I got my spot. I just trust how hard that was for me to hit it and I'll probably make it. Does that make sense? And if you watch on TV, that's what they all do. Do you notice they putt, they have practice strokes looking at the hole. But you can only do that if you've hit a bunch of putts actually doing it. And the reason that works, I'm gonna toss your ball there, Ken. Toss it back to me. Good. 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 Anybody throw it over my head? No. no. Anybody go like that? <laughs> no. We've thrown balls ever since we were kids. What did you do? I'm the target. You looked at me. You knew. How, did you think about how far back you went and how far you followed through? No. But do you think about that when you putt? A lot of people do. Right. Right, you shouldn't think, you, that should not be a thought. Be an athlete. Trust your eyes, trust your vision. But you gotta develop it. So when I have beginner golfers, or if you've got a spouse or a girlfriend or something, if they've never putted before, they have this putt, and they're right here, and the very first putt that they hit uh, goes like, well, I wouldn't have hit it, it goes off the green does. Very first putt anybody ever hits goes off the green. You know why? Well, when I, 
I have a track man, it's a launch monitor. If anybody's been on them before, there's a number called Smash Factor. Smash Factor is ball speed divided by club head speed. With a driver, if you have 150 mile an hour ball speed and 100 mile an hour club speed, your smash factor is 1.5. That's perfect. Okay? That's what we're trying to get somebody to when you get fit for a driver. 1.5 smash factor. Okay? That's by rule the maximum it's allowed to go at 100 miles an hour is 150. Okay? Even though some exceed that at higher club speeds. Driver's not the highest smash factor club in our bag. Putter is. Has four degrees aloft instead of ten. Makes the ball even hotter. The smash factor with a putter is 1.87, almost double. That's why a beginner hits it twice as far. They look at the hole, they think if I threw a ball to there, I'd swing like this. They swing the putter like that, it goes twice as far because it bounces. If I drop a ball on the cart path, it'll bounce. If I throw it down, it'll bounce really high, right? So that's what we have to learn is the bounce factor, and that's frankly difficult, okay? And so that's why you have to putt looking at the hole, in a nutshell. That smash factor with putter is a big deal, and we have to learn it. You have to learn it with your eyes, okay? Great betting game. Get three or four of you together, Play 18 holes on the putting green, you have to look at the hole on every putt. Play for a dollar hole. Winner buys drinks. <laughs> Pretty good game. Okay? Chris, you want to play? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense? Any questions on that? The only other thing I'll talk about putting real quick is setup. Setup's really important. Okay? You have to make sure that your putter sole's flat on the ground. The biggest mistake I see with most people is they got their hands low and the toe of the club's up in the air. There was a great Japanese player named Iseo Aoki, won the Hawaiian Open one year, was a legend in Japan. He putted with the toe up in the air. But he putted with an old Titleist bullseye putter that had zero degrees aloft. When you have a lofted club and the toe gets in the air, it makes the ball go left. So most people that putt this way, they pull it, and then once they get sick of pulling it, they push it, and they never hit it where they're aiming. So learn to sole it flat. That'll have a true aim then, okay? Um, come on up here, please, and set up right under that line for me. Most people, you don't need a ball, but pretend one's there. So good. So he's still just slightly toe up, if you ask me. Would everybody see that from yep. behind? Yep. So I would like his hands just a little taller. Yep. And then I would like, can you see the white line on your putter? It's a little bit on this side. All right. Now, he actually has a pretty good putting stroke. The main thing I look for is this. With everybody I watch putt, I want your forearms to be parallel to your target line. I see lots of players that are like this, and they wonder why they pull it. Because the putter goes outside, and then they open the face, so they got it going outside, and then they cut it, and it doesn't roll right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So putting, every full swings are very important to be square to our target line, too. But there's probably nothing more important than putting to have shoulders, forearms parallel to our target line. Make sense? Yeah. Now, just stay right there. <clears throat> Hopefully this won't blind you. But what I, the other thing guys do is they have a putting mirror. And they put it here between their feet. Can you see your shoulders in there? Yeah. Yeah, can you see your forearms? No. Do I need to move it in? Yeah, no, no, I can't. All right, good. So they have lines on a mirror. It's parallel to our line. They can check shoulders and all that. Most of them do this every day, too. If I move the ball around here, 
if your eyes are on the target line, you'll be able to see your eyes on this eye line right here. So you probably have to scoot back, right? Just a little. Yeah. Well, scoot back then. Put your putter behind the ball. Put it behind the ball? Yeah, just oh, like here. that. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, your eyes on this line. Are your eyes even in the mirror? No, they're not in the mirror. So no. that's right. So you need to get tilted more this way and or closer to the ball one. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or a shorter putter. So your putter's too long. Go ahead and hold mine. <laughs> now are your, can you see your eyes in the mirror? Yeah. Yeah. So my putter's 33 inches long. Do you know what the average putter on the PGA Tour length is? 33 inches long. Do you know what they sell in the shops? 36. Do you know why? The golf bags are 34 inches deep, and so when you put your putter in and it's only 33 inches, it falls through the hole. So they decided to make putters so they wouldn't fall through the hole in your bag, and everybody's misfit. Pretty interesting, yeah, huh? It's a 33-inch putter, but I put three extra inches on it. Then. Okay. Yeah. Does it help your back? Is yeah, that why you do it? I just, yeah. I just, you know. Are you a good putter? Yeah, no, I could be a lot better. All right. Yeah. I'd recommend. Sure. So choke down. Th so use a mirror and get your eyes over the mirror. Does that all make sense? Yep. I didn't know that. Okay. And the eyes should be in between the two reds. Uh, they can be in between the reds somewhere or on the line. I don't. I, but I want it in the same place every time. Right. So what? What tour players do if they like their eyes right here, they'll take a magic marker or sharpie and they'll draw their own eye line. Hmm. That way, every day they just get in it for a minute before they play and they check and make sure they're lined up right. Hmm. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Like that thing. I do. Do you like this? How am I doing time-wise? I don't either. Time is it? Quarter to five, four thirty. Good. Good. Understand? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So when you think being over the ball, I'm just trying to think of. Well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. You ever shot a rifle? Yes. All right. Would you, when you shoot a rifle, would you put your eyes down the target line of the rifle? On the shoulder. Well, no, that's not what I asked. And I asked, where would your eyes be? Yeah. Would you shoot a rifle like this? No. <laughs> why not? Yeah, line of sight. So why would you set up over here with the putter like this? Can you hit it where you're aiming? No. That's why we have these mirrors so we can get it. Now my eyes are just like I'm shooting a rifle. It's the same thing. Any pilots in here? Any what? Pilots? There's a thing with pilots called parallax error. Do you know how many lines are on a runway? So that you're landing on. You ever paid attention? Not one. If you know if there was one, they'd almost wreck three, every right? time. There's three. Yeah. There's three. How many lines are on a Callaway golf ball? Three. 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 Same reason. Parallax error. When I get away from something and the hole's over there, my perspective changes and I, most golfers aim to the right too much, if you ever notice that, it's the same reason. So, and then they go like this to hit it, okay? So, but, so I'm just telling you, if you really want to be great putting, eyelinegolf.com, that's where I get all my mirrors from, but almost all the tour players do too. For 30 bucks, man, in the winter in the basement on your putty mat, get a putting mirror and use it. It's awesome. Okay? Everybody's using it. Everybody's using this. If I had a putting mat at home, you obviously probably couldn't put stakes in the ground, but I can take a carpenter's chalk line and make a blue mark on the carpet and put on the line. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's how we did it in the old days. I, we weren't smart enough to use these. But... Um, when I was playing, but but um, but that's those are the training aids I like that putting arc and that, and then the putting motion once we get set up correctly um, is it, it's it's an arm swing. A lot of people think it's shoulders. Um, my shoulders move because my arms are attached to it, but it's really an arm swing putting. 
if I just use my shoulders, can everybody see my head goes forward and then backwards? And that's no good. See, if I use my arms, everything will stay still. Does that make sense? So that's the other thing I have to tell you about putting is, is you should feel your arms hang um, and, and swing your arms like a pendulum. Okay? And then experiment the, with, with people that I see where their forearms aren't parallel to their target line. Watch this. If I go left hand low, I'm parallel to my target line. So I kind of influence what grip I tell somebody to use putting on what grip does it take to get their forearms parallel to their target line. Okay? Make sense? Yes? Okay. Good. The other thing on reading greens, and I don't know if maybe we can see it. It's kind of hard this time of day. The first question you always ask yourself when you arrive on the green is, am I uphill or downhill? And here's why. I didn't show you this. Let me show you. i got to show you this. This is probably one of the most interesting things with the perfect putter. So this is what happens. This is what happens with everybody that plays. They have a downhill putt. See ya. Thanks so much. I hope very, you hope very, you enjoyed very helpful, it. By the way. Huh? Very helpful. Alright, great. I, have to cut out early. I understand. Thanks. So so watch. I'm gonna start this right here on this red dot. This is obviously downhill, right? Alright. Start it down the hill. Pretty fast green. Downwind, downhill. So I just hit that putt. It went one, two, three, four, five, six. Eight big steps, okay? Pretty much 25 feet probably, okay? So I'm going to start it on the red dot. I'm going to hit it exactly the same speed as I just hit. But now I'm uphill. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I saw that for the first time, that was pretty, I mean, that's pretty profound. Yeah, you're thinking you're doubling the speed, but you only need to do it four times. Absolutely, and that's about the ratio. Okay, and so here's what happens. Here's a, we're a good, pretty good player. Hit it on the green, 30 feet above the hole. Really fast, downwind, downhill. We put it to here, and we're, we don't realize how hard I gotta hit this next putt because it's into the wind up the hill, and I always leave it short, and I just three putted. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that cool? Yep. And so that's the first question as a player you have to ask yourself am I uphill or downhill? But there's ways to do it. Walk down here with me. I can kind of see it from here. In the middle of the day, it's a lot easier to see. If I look this way, just everybody just look up this way, and I'm going to walk up here. I want you to notice what color the grass is. And because everybody can tell that the grass is a different color up here than it is down there. All right, walk up here. If you've not heard this before, this is what I'm about to tell you is the best thing you'll learn all day. And it's harder to see with the sun. Let's scoot back here just a little bit more. All right. You can kind of see it, but does it, did it switch? Do you see it's darker here now and lighter down there? Okay. So what that is, this is bent grass. And the other green surface um, predominantly is either bent grass or Bermuda. Bermuda, it's even easier to see. But all grass has a grain, the direction it grows. It doesn't really affect the putt much on bent grass in terms of break, but it tells you whether you're uphill or downhill. 
because whenever the grass appears shiny, I call it shiny or light, you're going downhill. And whenever it's dark, you're going uphill. And so when somebody asks me about circling putts, mm -hmm. you'll see them do that on TV. They're looking at the color of the grass. They're really not looking at the slope. Hmm. I get on this side and I look at, see what color that is. Look here. Now come over here. Come over here. Look at the color as you walk by. Look this way. Can you tell it's shinier? Yes? Yeah, no? Yeah, yeah. That means it breaks that way. If I don't know which way it breaks, I can tell by the color of the grass. I know downhills that way because it's shinier grass that way. Make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And so that's what tour players will do. They'll look on both sides. If, if they can't tell which way it goes, they can tell by the color of grass. And it'll help you read in greens. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because, in my opinion, it's the number one mistake of miss putts is misreads. And if you don't know where uphill and downhill is, you can't read a green. Does that make sense? You may not read the amount, but at least you don't get double crossed on the direction. You don't yeah. you know, aim. I'm always asking my buddies to say, Am I reading this the right way? Because I have a hard time. Yeah, I know. It takes practice. The more you start looking for the color, the easier it'll be to see as you play, okay? So that's all I'll tell you. And this time of night with the sun so low, it's not as easy. Right. Man. So, um, but, and it just depends on the, every course is different. Some are grainier than others. The better the superintendent is at verticuts and top dresses, the less you'll see it. Uh, but Bermuda, you can really see it. And start watching on TV. You'll see the different shades of grass on the greens they're putting on televisions. You know, so you'll know when they're uphill or downhill yeah. by seeing the grain. Does that make sense? And I recommend that you look for it. Understand? Any questions on any of that? So, but that's what I would tell you is learn to read greens. Learn to roll them. Um, the other thing I try to find... that what most people try to find is what's called the apex of the putt. And so, like we noticed before on this putt, how much it breaks, well, that's my apex is, is really that ball marker. So if I can get that ball to roll above that apex, um, you know, it's going to be pretty good. So some people try to figure out what they think that apex point is on every breaking putt. And it's a pretty good way to practice. So, and you can, you can see as I roll that over there, you know, it's going to be pretty good. The other thing I would tell you is this, especially on fast greens and longer putts, if you overread the putt and play it too high, Go ahead and knock that back to me. Even though that stopped three feet short, let me hit it just a little harder on that line. So I can, even if I overread it, you'll see that as it comes down, it ends up pretty close to the hole. On a big breaking putt and fast greens, I can hit that the same speed but play it straight, and I'm going to miss it so far low, and it's going to go away from the hole. So. If, especially on big breaking putts from 30 or 40 feet, man, play a lot. Man, I could play a lot more break here, you know, and at least that ball's going to end up, you know, fairly close to the hole rather than rolling off the green down there. Does that make sense? So that, that's the other thing that I think most amateurs don't do. But learn to putt to these apexes like this and, um, um, uh, you'll end up, that's a pretty good way to read putts and try to figure out how they break too. So that's what I would tell you. And you can see if I play it too high, I'm hitting it up the hill so it doesn't really roll very fast down. Does that make sense? But boy, if I get it that way, it never, if I hit it at the hole and under read it, 
um, hitting at the same speed as that last one, I mean, it's just going to roll by so far that I'm probably going to three putt. Does that make sense? And how do you, how do you like really determine where the apex is, like on this kind of a putt? Like, <laughs> well, it's experience. You know? I can see, I can stand here and I can tell you that. Yeah. Because I've done it so much. Does that make sense? But I've learned to do it with a perfect putter. I've learned to to hit, have people watch from behind me and say, no, you didn't play it high enough. You didn't yeah. play it high enough. You didn't play it high enough until you learned to do it. Does that make sense? Hit one there. Here. So I guess it's like the, the lesson that I'm kind of seeing is like just play it a little more, a little more break than you think. Uh, double for most players. Yeah. That's a pretty good place to start. But see, that's a great putt from here. Does that make sense? So the other thing I didn't mention that I should. From three feet away from the hole, what do you think a tour player makes out of 100? 99. He's probably 90. 99. 99. Oh, he's How many do you think they make from eight feet? It's 50. Yeah, I know it. By the time they get to 15, 16, 17 feet, it's only 15 out of 100. So the best players in the world on this putt you just hit, this is probably 15 feet, it's pretty close. If it's not, probably this is, would you agree? 15 feet, they're going to miss 85 times. So if it does not go in, I do not want to miss the next one. That's all I care about. Right, right, right. You understand that? Yeah. The tour players only three putt once every two and a half rounds of golf. Wow. <laughs> okay? So the best way to improve any of your all scores is to avoid three putts. And yeah. so, so we have to do that with three skills. We have to be able to aim. We have to be able to hit at the right speed. And we have to be able to read the green correctly. So focus your time on just those three things. Now, that being said, because three putt avoidance is the most important thing, if you can't make nine out of 10 from here, practice until you can. Rule number one. If you don't three putt from 12 or 15 or 18 feet, you're pretty good at that distance. Don't waste your time practicing them because all you're practicing is missing. Okay? As long as you don't three putt. But if you start three putting from 25 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. Well, then practice those so you can get your speed right. Practice short putts. I would say eight foot and in where you got a good chance of making them. And then 20 feet and longer where you got a pretty good chance of three putting. So before you play, go to the putting green before you tee off. Make five in a row from three feet. Once you do, then go to 30 or 40 feet on the putting green and practice those lag putts. Do it uphill. Do it downhill. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because of that uphill-downhill is pretty amazing difference, right? Yeah. Understand? Yep. So that's what I would tell you. Um, if, you have, if you don't have a job and you have an unlimited amount of practice time, well then you can practice all these distances. But if you only got a few <laughs> hours to practice, okay, make the practice worthwhile. Practice the short ones till you can make them. Do it on a line, like that string. Do it with the mirror. And then practice 30 feet and longer, 20, wherever you three, if you're three putting from 15 feet, then practice 15 footers.
But if you're not, go to where you're having learn. Do your weaknesses. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I do want to talk about two more things before I leave you. I'll be right back. Just stay here. All right. We talked about practicing the yardages um, on our pitch shots. Okay, 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards. Chip shots around the green, you have to learn a ratio of carry distance and roll distance to be a good chipper. Okay? The best players can hit at one four three fourths, one third two thirds, fifty fifty, two thirds one third, three quarter one quarter. They're doing it for a living, so they better be have all those shots. As a recreational player, you need at least one shot, in my opinion, and that's 50-50. And if you have two shots, it's one-third, two-thirds. So I've already set up here. You can see where that stick is on that hole. Um, this bowl marker here is one-third of the distance to there, okay? And then this marker is halfway, 50-50. So for me, I set up the same way and I use two different clubs. My 54 degree sand wedge goes one third, two thirds. And this is on a green that stems nine or 10. If, it, if they're faster than that, it would roll a little more. If they're slower than that, it'd roll a little less. But on an average speed green, this is what this does, okay? And so, this is a chip shot, not a pitch. I'm gonna play it more by my right foot with my hands ahead. Um, not much wrist action at all, but I am gonna turn and I'm gonna bottom that out, see if I'm any good at this. I'm gonna try to land it um, right on that dot, and if I get pretty close to it, it's going to give me a pretty good speed, pretty tough shot with the wind blowing right there. That was a good shot. So same thing, one-third, two-thirds. It lands one-third, rolls two-thirds. I can get that up and down all the time. No matter where this hole is, if I was chipping to this one, third of the way is in here somewhere, I just hit it there, I know it's going to roll. It's math. This has 54 degrees aloft. It's going to have a launch angle. It's going to have a little bit of spin. It's a very predictable shot. It's going to go one-third, two-thirds. If I make impact with that shaft lean, it's going to go one-third, two-thirds almost every time. Now uphill, downhill makes it, that's on a flat, stepping nine surface. If I add loft by flipping my hands, well, it's not going to go one-third, two-thirds no more. It's going to go 50-50. So that's my recommendation to practice is learn to hit a shot that goes one-third, two-thirds. Get 21 feet from the hole, hit it seven feet. 15 feet from the hole, hit it five feet. Learn to roll it there, okay? Now, for me, if you carry different wedges, if um, my 60-degree wedge has six more degrees aloft than my 54, but if I set up the same way, because it has more aloft, it ends up hitting a 50-50 shot. So I can set up there. I'm trying to land it on that dot that's a little short, so my ball will be a little short. So, but still not bad. I might be able to make that one. That's a lot better. And you'll see that it's a 50-50 shot. Ooh, about made it. Does that make sense? And that's how I play. And that's how the best players in the world play. They know where they're going to land it. They know their trajectories, and they know what the ball is going to do after it lands. Does that make sense? And so, even if I'm going down to this hole that breaks so hard, down there where that ball is, see, I know I only have to get it to the top of the hill, and it'll roll down there. Does that make sense? So, I about where the shadow of he is with the camera is about halfway there. So, I know that all I have to do is landed somewhere around that shadow, little long, but it'll get on that hill and it'll roll down there. You see that'll go past because I was too far.
that's short. That ought to be pretty close if it don't hit that ball. And so that's how I would hit that shot on the golf course. I would say, I know I just have to get over the hill, so I'm going to land it halfway there and because I know this club goes 50-50. And it's not that I'm a great touch. It's just that I'm good enough to hit it close to the shadow, but I'm smart enough to know that that's how it, the ball is going to come off this club every time. And I've practiced it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody ever done that before or thought of that? Yes? Yeah. Good. I've been taught that before. <laughs> uh-huh. So. I started doing that. It seems to make a difference. Good. So always pick a spot anywhere that you're trying to land it. You should always have a spot in mind of where you want your ball to land. And then that's the talent is landing on the spot. Then the reads the talent of what the ball is going to do once it starts rolling. But you have to have a method of, and, a, and an idea and a concept of what you're trying to do. And if you, that's, you know, I, I, I've, all I've done is talk tonight, but I did that on, really on purpose. I, I mean, understanding the right concepts is what's important. If you understand the concepts of how to hit these shots and how to play, um, you'll figure out the technique. That's the easy part. Most people have the wrong concept or they have no concept at all. Most people, in my opinion, on short game have no concept at all. Yep. And um, full swing, most people at least have a concept. It may be wrong, but at least they are trying to do something. But most people here are looking at the hole and trying to hit it close and they don't have any idea where to land it or how high to hit it or what club to use or and what to do when, does that make sense? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, on a course like ours here, we have lots of zoysia surrounds. So the last thing I'll tell you is if you're no good at chipping, use your putter, because your worst putt's always going to be better than your worst chip. And uh, my friend Jerry Tucker, I saw yesterday, he doesn't call it a putter off the green. He calls it his four-degree wedge. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a pretty right. good... I thought that was a pretty good thing to say. Yeah. I'm using my four degree wedge on this shot. He lives in Florida now. Frankly, putty on Bermuda, putting off the green in Florida, Arizona, is, man, that's the easiest thing to do and it's probably the most correct thing to do. Right, right. In the old days they called it a Texas wedge too because down in Texas, but they didn't. But I kind of like four degree wedge. I, I, thought, like that, I like, yeah. thought that was good. All right, any questions? Uh, one question. Sure. Like to see uh, around the green, I always struggle with lack of confidence as far as do I put more loft on, on my club? I, do, I, do I keep it, my hands down? Do I raise, open it up and raise it up as far as? Good question. Right hand, you know, good, thing. good. That's a great question. Um, that's changed over the years. So with most people that I find that are close to my age or maybe 10 years younger than me, they all chip with their stance open and their face open, okay? That's how they were taught. That's how I was taught. I was taught that way because my most lofted club when I was learning to play was my pitching wedge, and it was 52 degrees. So if I had to hit a lofted shot, I had to open the face. So it might have been you. Somebody asked me, might have been you, asked me, why do I, I don't, I'm not any good with my 60-degree wedge. Why do I use it? Frankly, you use a 60 degree wedge because it has a lot of loft and you can play with a square face. Because once you open the face, the ball starts deflecting off of it and it's very difficult to control the distance then. And so that's probably the biggest improvement over the years with all these wedges. Most of the guys on tour now have 64 degree wedges. And so they can play from a square face and still have plenty of loft. Does that make sense? Now the reason you need to have a one-third shot or a one-half shot or a three-quarter shot to answer your question, what do I need to do? Well that depends where the hole is. Okay? So if the hole's right here and I'm right here, I can hit a one-third, two-third shot. And I would. The more I get it to roll, the better. I will say that. Okay? So 
I would always hit my one third, two third shot if I can. But say the hole's there. And I'm here. Now I can't hit, I can hit a one third shot but it has to land here and I don't know how it's going to bounce. I, so I always, in Missouri, on our greens, you always want to land it on the green if you can. Now in Florida, that's different. That Bermuda, it's pretty easy to run it up. Arizona, you can putt it and run it up. But Zoysia, the ball doesn't bounce very good. And so here I would have to hit at least a 50-50 shot. Would you agree with that? Yes. And so, and if I was farther down the hill, I would have to hit a 75% shot. And I would play that farther forward and my hands back and I would add loft. I really wouldn't open the face unless I had to anymore. If I have a 60 degree club, I can play it more forward and I can put the handle back and it's still pretty square faced. Do you see that? And that's how I would hit it. But I would try to keep that same angle back and through as I go and then I'd have that loft and if so if I set up that way and I keep that same angle do you see how soft that'll hit it so that's one of the keys to chipping is that whatever angle I have this club on at a dress I have to return to impact on that exact same angle exact if that angle is not exact I'm going to miss hit it fat or thin one I, yeah, my, my uh, highest loft is my 56, uh -huh. so I find myself you know, debating, opening up a little bit, quite a bit now. Yep, when's your birthday? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just past. I got, one of the, I got one in the house, I just never got comfortable yep. hitting it, right? Yeah, so, so I understand, but you learn to use it. It'll, it should be your favorite club, in my opinion. That's, and, um, and... Yeah, so that's pretty close. So a lot, of 50, a lot of players play with 58. If you have a 58, your sand wedge should be 54. 54 and I have a 50. Perfect. You're not going to believe what my fishing wedge degree is. Yeah, 46, yeah. No. Yeah. And so even for you, if you have high club head speed, a 62 is not a bad club in some courses. I mean, it's not worth, you know, may not play it everywhere. I usually didn't carry a 60 degree wedge when I played in Florida. The greens were so big compared to around here that I rarely had to hit a high soft shot. I could almost always hit my one third shot. They're rolling. Yeah, right. Does that make sense? And so I would carry, the courses were so long, you, I had a lot of 220 yard par threes, so I'd carry another five wood or a or a one iron or something up there on the other end of my bag. Does that make it in Florida? I mean, I is when I was playing, I probably had 20 clubs that I would rotate, set, rotate depending on where I was playing. Yeah. If I went to Kansas and the wind blew like this every day, I had a seven degree driver. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then I, th that I used, does that make sense? Yeah. Didn't use my 60 in Florida. Went to Paducah, Kentucky, and the greens were about this big around. I had a 64 degree club. <coughs> Make sense? Yeah. So, and the modern tour players have a tour van out there every day now. They get anything they want that week. Right. <laughs> so, so here's one of my favorite putting drills, but it's also a great game. Two guys. Yeah, you remember this one, don't you? I don't have any quarters. I'd usually use quarters. Uh, six feet, three feet, six feet. Put another quarter down. Three feet, six feet. Remember how to play it? Come on up here first. Here's the game. You always start here, okay? And your goal is to get as many points as possible. Whoever gets the most points wins the bet. Or you play a dollar point, however you want to do it. Okay? So what he's got to do is he has to putt that ball and it has to stop between these two marks. Okay? Go ahead and do that for me. No, don't tell him that yet. But that's pretty good. So, 
he's got a point. But for his second attempt, you have to move the mark to where his last ball was. Now he has to be between those two marks again to win a point. Yeah, it is. Do that same so he's got he's got two points. Tour player would average twelve points in this game. No, I'm wow. Is this when you push double or nothing? <laughs> so I'm just telling you, it's a great way to practice and do that. So he's got two oh. points. So whoever is playing against him, all you got to do is get three to win. Wow! Wow! Pretty cool game. It is a pretty cool game. So, yeah, used to be a lot better at that. <laughs> I remember getting like seven, eight. <laughs> no, so I'll leave these here before you go in. You can try it. I think he was sandbagging you there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I realize that. I realize that every time I play golf. No, wait. An average tour player get 12? Yeah. On this, on this time. Yes, because their first putt would stop right here and they'd only move it an inch and their next putt would stop right here and they'd only miss. That's how good they are at controlling speed. And it's a, why this is a great drill is because on tour, there's a big difference in the guys from 6 to 12 feet on how much money they make. The guy that makes 50% of his putts from 6 to 12 feet, and the guy that only makes 40% from 6 to 12 feet is a big difference in money. Yeah. And so they, they try to do drills that practice where that, see, they all make them from 3 feet. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. But boy, this 6 to 12 feet is probably the difference between the top 50 in the world and the rest of the guys in the world. So when you're like, especially like in your three foot putts, do you aim for the back of the hole? To hit the back of the hole or? No. No? Okay. I just want it to roll in the hole. <laughs> um, I understand why you asked that. Most people would say they try to hit it firm enough to play it straight. Yeah. So I do that. But if you're truly aiming for it to hit the back of the hole, and you hit the edges, it won't go in. You have to have, it's called holding, correct holding speed. And in my opinion, that's for a ball that maybe goes seven to 10 inches past the hole. I didn't mention that. I, I There's Dave Pels, who's a great short game instructor and <laughs> scientist, really. He did research that said 18 inches is the best to hold by the hole, but I find that tournament players that roll it 18 inches by three putt too often because every once in a while they roll it 30 inches by and they get nervous and then once they miss one then they're short so I like only rolling it about that far by and learning to do that okay that's good advice yeah that's a good drill Thank you guys. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you, Ed.